So I think we have a question coming. <laughs> I was just noticing when you're talking about the youngsters in the company and how proud they are, you sound almost like you're talking about your own children. <laughs> Is that how you see them? No, I don't see them as children, but I see them as young artists. Oh, we have mature artists too. Uh, no, I, I, I don't see them as children. I see my cat as a child, but... <laughs> That's what happens when you don't have your own children, I guess. Um, no, they're very, they're very grown up and developed, and they don't, they're not children. They, uh, they're quite forthright in their opinions, and yeah. I mean, maybe some of the apprentices when they're 18, but uh, no, I, I, I like to nurture them, but I don't necessarily think that's the same as uh, considering them children. <laughs> Nobody else? You don't dance at all in your home, in your living room. <laughs> you... I'm going to repeat that just so everybody here. Uh, the, the, the young lady at the front here was just asking Karen, uh, do you still dance? Karen won't want me to tell you the story, but. A <laughs> couple, couple of years ago, it was only a couple of years ago, I was doing a preview talk with Karen at the ballet uh, about Giselle, which Karen hasn't danced since the 90s, early, no, even late 80s or early 90s. I, I mean, it's a remember, long time ago. Yeah. And she'd already hung up her dancing shoes for more than a decade. So at the end of this, and, and Karen, we were talking about Giselle, right? And... Um, so at the end of the proceedings, people, of course, want to have Karen's autograph, and people have brought copies of her autobiography to have signed, and all that stuff that Karen has had to put up with throughout her career. Anyway, this woman came up to me and said, can you tell me which night Karen's dancing? <laughs> and when I told Karen afterwards, she said she must need new glasses. <laughs> but that is a good question, because let's face it, uh, Celia Franca, although she had retired as a, a ballerina in 1958-59, whatever it was, continued doing character roles into the 1980s, into her 60s. Um, Lois Smith, a former prima with the company, guested with the company. Uh, Alexander Grant, when he was director of the company, appeared in character roles. So did Eric Brune. Uh, you have only actually gone back on stage maybe twice as Lady Capulet, and that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a lot of people were kind of hoping you might take on some character roles, but you've chosen not to. Well, I did, you know, I did Lady Capulet, and that I enjoyed that. I just feel that I have these um, other mature artists in the company who want to do these roles, and I feel that I had my time, and I certainly had more than my fair share of time, and that um, I want them to have the chance to to do those, and uh, so that, that, and I'm not, I'm not so driven to be on stage. I I was never, um, I was on stage because I love to dance, not because I love to perform. The performing part was the hardest part for me, and I had to work many years on my stage fright and and the pressure of performing. But my love of dancing was so strong that I was willing to put up with that. Um, but I don't, I don't miss being in the spotlight. I actually really like being behind the scenes and enjoying it from the darkened theater. So I have no, you know, some people just can't live without it. They just have to be up there. And I, I'm not like that. So, um, oh, and dancing. Um, there you are. I, um, I, I try to exercise when I can. Uh, I'm not very good about it. I feel better when I do it. Actually, the one good thing about being on tour is I could go for long walks every day because I wasn't in so many meetings. <laughs> um, I do kind of dance around my kitchen a little bit if I like the music, but I usually stop pretty quickly because it hurts. <laughs> Um, the odd fundraiser, if the music's really great and I've had a few glasses of wine, I'll get up and... <laughs> but, no, I, I don't really dance anymore. I'm just going to repeat that yes, so people yes. at the back could hear. 
Um, the, the question was asking Karen, what's her earliest memory? I think I got this right, of herself dancing that you can recall. Is that it? Yeah. I remember very distinctly that I used to go down in our basement, in our, you know, our rec room in the, in the basement, as, as a probably a nine or ten years of age. I'd already seen Celia Franca dance, and I was already smitten with her Giselle and everything. But um, I like to put on music, and I would either sit and imagine dancing to it, or I would actually dance around the basement. My, my fa we only had two records at the time, and they were my dad's, and they were military marching bands. <laughs> And then he had one other, he had some Scottish singer, and it was called, uh, his most famous song was Donald Where's Your Trousers. <laughs> so that's what I danced around by myself in, in the basement. And then when I started taking ballet lessons, my mother took, a, there was a lady teaching in her basement. Uh, not far from us when we had we lived in Ancaster at the time and she was teaching in her basement and I could walk from the house it wasn't very far and she had a couch in the basement and a kitty litter box and she had a, um, a recorder and she had one 45 record and it was um, Patty, uh, what's her name? Tennessee Walls. Pat Patty Page singing the Tennessee Walls. And I would do an hour class to that, just repeat it over and over. <laughs> and I'd sort of leap over the kitty litter box and around. Um, and then she told my mother to get me point shoes for Christmas. And my mother had been reading. McLean's or Chatelaine or something, and they had talked about how bad it was to put a child on point too soon, and she thought, um, have to take me away from that teacher. Sent me to another teacher in Ancaster, who is still alive, and who was teaching at the own old town hall, and she's the one who told my parents after I'd been there for a year that they should take me to the National Ballet School. So, you know, again, serendipity and how things, we'd never heard of the National Ballet School. so. That's how I got there. Yeah. I want to say thank you so much for your genius. Um, you're, it's incredible to have the opportunity to hear you speak. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned Lady Gaga and the White Stripes. And I was, <laughs> I was wondering, has your opinion of popular culture changed over your career? Or has it always been a mutual admiration? Or has it always been something that was, you know, I can do that, but I don't want to? Um, I, I, ne I never thought that. I've always appreciated popular culture. You know, I grew up loving the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and all of that, and I love to listen. I, I don't, I love musical theater. I love, I love all kinds of art forms. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm a snob, and I don't feel like anything is better than anything else. I think that we can, we all exist together. We all provide pleasure. Um, yeah, I, I, I love popular music, and uh, it makes it, it, when I want to exercise or something, I'd much rather play music that makes you feel like moving and having fun than, than something serious. Right. Um, can you do the moonwalk? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have not mastered the moonwalk. <laughs> Many years ago, Mr. Yes, I'm being asked okay, about Okay, I, I just need so everybody can hear the question. It was a, a reference to the fact that Karen has appeared with her husband, uh, Ross Petty, who both produces and performs in an annual uh, sort of traditional English-style pantomime. I think it's fair to say it's sort of that English pantomime tradition. Uh, he usually plays the... The, the dame, it, the pantomime yes, dame. The, the, the villain, always, whether it's male or female, he yeah. plays the villain, yes. <laughs> uh, but, but you appeared, uh, what did you, I, I think I saw that, what were you? you were... Um, well, I, I don't even remember what year it was, but the British, the original British p producer, um, whose name, uh, I mean, he, he's also a producer of in Private Lives that's right now here in town, but anyway, uh, Paul, he, he approached me uh, and asked if I would like to be in, in um, I, met, I can't remember which one it was, and I had just met Ross, but my husband, but I was thinking this would be good for me because 
I have never spoken a word on stage, and I, I need to make myself have the courage to go on stage and talk. So I decided to do it. I was the good fairy. Um, <laughs> and it was a real British panto, like the original kind with the, the principal boy, so a, man, a woman dressed as a man, and a man dressed as a woman, and it's all really strange and weird and wonderful. And, um, uh, we ca it, and it was all these British pros. I was the only Canadian in the cast. And the dress rehearsal, my husband came to see the dress rehearsal, and nobody was doing their thing. They were all just, they'd done a million of them, they were kind of walking through it. The sets had just come off the boat from England. They were all look, looking terrible. The lighting wasn't done. And I was trying. My throat was, you know, like tight as anything. But I was trying to learn how to be able to stand on a stage and instead of express myself dancing, to actually speak. And after the dress rehearsal, my husband said to me, I just don't know what you have gotten yourself into. Because <laughs> it was really, really bad. I mean, and the next night, the next night they all came to life, and the physical humor was incredible. The Brits, they know how to do this. It just at, at their fingertips. And it was fantastic and silly and fun. And everyone loved it, and he, he saw. And then he thought to himself, my husband, I could do that. <laughs> So the next year, we were both in it. And then this British producer said, I'm not making any money in Canada. I'm going to stop doing these shows. And Ross said, let me produce it. And so now it's been 15 years he's been producing the show himself. And uh, I mean, it's totally Canadianized. It's not like the British panto anymore. I had a blast doing them. I did at least four or five of them. And we toured them across the country sometimes. And sometimes I did the panto and Nutcracker at the same time, <laughs> going back and forth across the city. And uh, it was great fun. And I still like going to see them. I think they're really fun and silly, and they're much more topical Canadian humor now. But. The, uh, your description of the Romeo and Juliet sounds fabulous. I'm wondering if there's um, some other highlights of the 60th year that you'd like to talk about, and if there's a particular theme that you're celebrating, 60. Yeah, if, uh, thank you, great question. Uh, I guess the theme, I, I tried to balance out the new with the old, so that I, I paid some tribute to the past of the company and brought back some things that people would, would, would bring back memories. And you know, so elite syncopations, which I'm bringing back in June, is you know, a ballet I love to do, and it's fun, and it's got Joplin, and it's ragtime, and the dancers have fun, and it's part of the history of the company, as well as Female Garde, which uh, unfortunately we just lost Alexander Grant, who was um, the one who originated one of the most important roles in Fee, and who was our artistic director for quite a while, and who brought Fee to the company, Sir Frederick Ashton. It's a brilliant, brilliant little gem of a ballet. And we haven't done it for quite a while, and it needed to be repaired, and this was a good excuse to get the set spiffed up and everything, because it was kind of falling apart. Um, uh, and I wanted to bring back Chroma, because it was about uh, now and the future, and I wanted to mix it up with Elite from the past. And I brought in Song of a Wayfarer because I have these two brilliant artists, or three brilliant artists, who will share it. Um, and it's uh, a wonderful work by Maurice Bejar, probably one of his best. Um, and uh, Romeo, we decided to do it all fall because we had the opportunity to make some good box office, which will cover us for everything else. And it's an experiment this year. Um, so that, that forced us into doing three programs in March, which is difficult for the patrons and difficult for the dancers, but we're doing it anyway. Um, and Sleeping Beauty is a huge part of the heritage of this company, um, but I wanted to do the Seagull because it's new and different and wonderful and very contemporary. And then Fee, which we haven't seen for a long time, and that I, a ballet that I adore. And then a brand new Hamlet, something again for the future, uh, mixed with the, the Chroma Elite Song of the Wayfarer program. So 
there's just something for everybody. And there's something about the future and where we're going, and there's uh, a nod to our past and our heritage and the, and the great works that we've had in the rep for a long time. So, and, and you know, the choices were huge, but I, I just had eventually had to narrow down <laughs> to do those things. We do have time for a couple more questions. Yes. <laughs> okay, the question was, what was it like to work with Rudolf Nureyev? And for those of you who don't know the backstory to this, I think Karen will probably agree that, that when Rudolf Nureyev arrived to work with the company in 1972 to stage The Sleeping Beauty, which Karen has personally revived and, and sort of nursed back to life because it had got a little rusty and so on back in the late 90s, and which you will be able to see this season, um, Nureyev was a great talent spotter, and he spotted Karen's talent, and that, of course, of her longtime partner at the time, Frank Augustin, and also took Karen around the world as a guest artist and, and had a very significant influence. But anyway, so the, that's why the question arises about your experience with Rudolf Nureyev. Um, as Michael said, he, he loved young talent, and he was an extraordinarily generous man. Uh, not all superstars that I met along the way were generous as he was. He really cared about passing on what he knew and helping people uh, help them launch their careers. And he, he did that with a number of us at the National Ballet of Canada. He loved working with, with uh, us, he, but he was really my mentor, the person who gave me confidence to believe in myself because he believed in me so much. And uh, I mean, he was also difficult. He could be very difficult. He could be very bad tempered. He pushed himself very hard. Um, and he had he was dealing with many things that we didn't realize till later um, that he was ill and things like that. But during the during the 70s, for almost a decade, we had a we had an amazing experience with him. And because of him, the National Ballet actually gained an international reputation as one of the best companies in the world. And we went to New York every summer, and we played for a month at the Metropolitan Opera House. As a young dancer, it, I knew it was extraordinary, but I didn't really realize. I thought it would always be like that for this company. I didn't know how hard we were going to have to work to get back to New York or to get back to all those places that we went regularly with Rudolph. And, and then personally, he took me all over the world. He took me to Australia, he took me to Vienna, he took me to London, and I danced with him with different companies. But what he did for the National Ballet of Canada was to put us on the world map. And we have not yet regained that since that time. And I know it's a different world, but um, yeah, he, he cared very, very much about mentoring young talent. And he did it in every company. He would, he would go, he would see who was responsive, who wanted to work hard, because working hard was for him. It's not the talent, it's how hard you work. But if you have all those ingredients, he was willing. Uh, just as an example, um, when he first came, I wasn't dancing in Sleeping Beauty. I was doing Swan Lake with him, and other ballerinas were doing Sleeping Beauty. And he started badgering Celia from the first moment he saw me. She has to do Aurora, she has to do Aurora, and Celia was trying to dole out the workload in a, in a way that was respectful of everyone. He wouldn't let it go. He started rehearsing me on the tour, where he was dancing seven times a week. And between matinee and evening, he would get me on the stage and rehearse me, and so that I could make my debut in Houston, it turned out. Um, and, you know, for Celia, it was very, very difficult because he overrode her as artistic director. And, uh, and, but she knew that it was the best thing for the National Ballet at that time, and she just sucked it up, and she actually would leave the tour when she couldn't take him anymore. <laughs> But, you know, she sacrificed that for us because she knew that it was the best thing for the National Ballet. And I, you know, I always remember that, how, how hard it was for her. But he, for, for that period of time, he was the one who launched us, and, and many of us individually and the company as a whole. I think we've got just, yeah, as well, long as we finish by 10 past. Oh dear, so many hands, so many hands. Okay, yes, you're first. Your long-term partner was Frank Augustin. He's a Canadian. Do you ever keep in touch and compare your careers? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Uh, we do. Uh, he is a professor at Adelphi University on Long Island, and uh, he came back. We invited him back for the opening of the Four Seasons Center for the Performing Arts when we opened it with Sleeping Beauty. He's been invited back. I've invited all the alumni back for the opening of Romeo and Juliet. I, they can't all come. They're all spread around the world, but many of them are coming. And I haven't heard whether he has our SVP because I have been on the road for the last month. Um, but maybe he will come back for that evening. Because Frank's been in the States quite a while now, hasn't yes. he? Yes, yeah, yeah. a long quite time. Quite a long time, yeah, yeah. Which prompts the story we're talking about, Romeo and Juliet. The production of Romeo and Juliet, Karen was telling you about, the John Cranko version, which did such long service. Um, the first production they built, with, which was a re essentially a reproduction of what this designer, Jürgen Rose, had made for Stuttgart, and it was reproduced another version here, uh, was part of, a large part of it was burned. <clears throat> Remember, there was a fire, and a large part of Romeo and Juliet was destroyed. I think it was in 72, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then when Alexander Grant was director, they managed to get the money together to revive it. And the premiere of that revival, having rebuilt the costume sets, whatever, was in Montreal at the Cultural Olympics with Karen and Frank uh, doing the opening night. Remember that in the, the Cultural Olympics? And I happened to be sitting next to Alexander Grant, and at the end of the balcony scene, where there's an intermission, uh, I turned to him, and he had tears streaming down his cheeks. And I said, Alexander, what's on earth the matter? You're crying. And he said, I was going to ask you the same thing. <laughs> that's, that's what the power of great dancers can do for you. I'm not, I'm not, sure, if I, I'm not sure if I told Karen this. There, there's um, a, a performing arts lawyer I know in Washington, D.C., who's a big, big ballet fan. And he went to London for the um, La Royal Ballet premiere of Alice in February. And then he obviously is so curious, he came here to see the production here. And not only did he think that the company danced it better, but the other thing which I think is really interesting uh, was he said, and key to that was the fact that the orchestra here in Toronto was so much better than Covent Garden. <laughs> but the, um, our orchestra just love it, and, and the, but the acoustic in our theatre is also superior. Um, I, I love that our orchestra are also really keen on all the new work, and they love Joby Talbot, the composer, and he also did the music for Chroma. So they'd already worked with Joby Talbot, and Joby loves them, and he loves the way his music sounds in Toronto. So um, it, it was sort of a win-win. But uh, we've just sent it back to England, and it'll be coming back again. And uh, we'll just keep sending it back and forth across the ocean. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and we, we will have it back uh, in the near future so that everyone who missed it, because I had a lot of complaints that people could, I couldn't get a ticket for my own husband. You know, it was really, we've never had that happen. So next time we'll put on more shows. <laughs> well, we're more or less finishing up on, on the schedule that I was given. Um, I'm sure there probably will be more questions you'd like to ask, and there'll be other opportunities. Do, don't forget, Karen is often speaking at the ballet in preview talks, so you should keep an eye out when she's making an appearance at one of those. Um, on your behalf, I would like to thank, well, obviously, the Toronto Star and the Toronto Reference Library for making this event possible. Um, but most especially, of course, Karen, for taking time from what I know is a very busy schedule to be with us tonight and to, to share with us her insights and her stories and her pride in the National Ballet, which is celebrating its 60th anniversary this year, and Romeo and Juliet opens on the 16th of November. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Thank you.